I want to begin this morning with a familiar story that probably everybody online has heard numerous times. I want to take your mind back to the story of the Wizard of Oz. Probably everybody on the planet has seen one version or that or another in many different languages and how powerful that story is. It's just plain good storytelling. And we know what the story's about. I'm not going to relive the whole thing. But what it's about is simply four strangers who become friends through adversity. Because these four strangers, they, they share something in common. They're, they're looking for something that they're convinced they don't have. And so on the journey to, on the yellow brick road to the city of Oz to meet the wizard, they're looking for something that they don't have. What's what's the scarecrow looking for? He's looking for what? A brain. How about the tin man? What's he looking for? He's looking for a heart. And the lion, what's he looking for? He's looking for courage. I love saying it that way. And what's Dorothy looking for? She's looking to go home. And then you've got the Wicked Witch of the West who's looking for the ruby shoes and the little dog too. So everyone's looking for something that they're convinced they don't have. And through adversity, through trials and tribulation, they get to Oz, they get to the city of Oz, they meet the wizard and that's a humongous disappointment. But the bottom line is the whole message of the Wizard of Oz is, Scarecrow, you already have a brain. Tin Man, you already have a heart. Lion, you already have courage. And Dorothy, you can go home anytime you want because you have what you need. I think it's a wonderful metaphor of Christians and of the church. I think that many times, especially in the American church, we look for things. We, we, look, for, we look for things that we don't have. We need this and we need that and we need this and we need that to do the work And what the word of God comes to us and says is by the spirit of Christ inside of us, we have everything we need. We don't need anything else. And I think if COVID has taught us anything, it is that, is that for us to be a church, yes, it would be wonderful to gather again and Lord willing, someday we will, but we don't need that to do the work of ministry. What we need is Christ's spirit to rule in and through us. And that's one of the reasons why we've been looking at different habits that were kind of introduced to us by the book Surprise Your World by Michael Frost. And we've just simply been going through the last few weeks looking at these habits on what we can be able to do because these habits we can be able to do and the church would explode if we lived out these habits. And that's the position of Frost. I think that's my position as well. Just in the way of review, let's look at some of these habits. The first three are, first of all, habit number one, bless at least three people this week, one of whom is not a Christ follower. That's all we do is, is each week we, we pray about and we look for the, the Spirit's listening, uh, voice to us telling us, go bless that person. What I mean by that is not a pat on the back or, hey, army of one, you can do it, but rather something that lifts them up, that, that dusts them off, that gets them going, that, that builds them up, something that is truly that powerful. So let's find three people and bless them, one being not a Christ follower. How powerful would that be? And then habit number two, <clears throat> Eat with three people this month, one of whom is not a Christ follower. You know as well as I that when you've got a, a table full of food, walls drop and bridges are formed. And you begin to have these conversations that are so wonderful and so encouraging. And, and, and the intent here is just to find three people in the course of a month and sit down with them over a meal a dessert, a bowl of popcorn, a a full sit-down dinner, something that that drops the walls, not with the intent, okay, I've got to find an inn to get the gospel in, but rather to love them, to encourage them, yes, even to bless them and see what happens because all of a sudden, strangers become neighbors, neighbors become friends, and and, and friends become family. That's typically what happens. And then last week, we looked at habit number three, Spend a specific amount of time each week solely listening to God's voice. Did you do that? Don't don't beat yourself over the head if you didn't. But did you do that? Did you take 5, 10, 15 minutes sometime this week? You turned everything off. You turned everything off and the only ambient noise was 
you breathing? And you listened. If you did, what names came up? Maybe what sins were unburied and uncovered and brought to the surface that you could be able to confess and receive forgiveness? What, what was that? You need not fear. We have a Father in heaven who cares for us, and he wants us to listen to him. So we're able to do that. Today, the habit you might be looking to find out where it is, it's this one. I will spend a specific amount of time each week learning Jesus. I will spend a significant amount of time each week learning Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? I I had to think about that too because that's how Frost expresses it. He expresses it in the sense of, of just learning Jesus, not learning about Jesus. And that's unique because I could tell you, for example, I'm going to learn about guitar. And you would take that as I'm going to read up on it. I'm going to look at uh, maybe some websites on how guitars are made. I'm going to look at the neck and the different frets and the different strings, uh, how the, the, the nuts on the fret work and why the holes in the middle and the shape of the guitar. I can look in all of that and find all kinds of things about the guitar. And you would know that when I say I'm learning about the guitar, you know what I would mean by that. But then if I say, I'm learning guitar. All of a sudden, you know exactly what I mean. I'm learning how to play. I'm learning different chord positions with my left hand. I'm learning pick patterns with my right hand. I'm learning strumming and different notes and different strings. I'm learning the guitar. That's what I think we're talking about today. It's not learning about Jesus, but learning Jesus. And, and This is so very, very important because when we're learning Jesus, all of a sudden, we are connecting him into our life situation. It goes much deeper than what would Jesus do, but rather it would go to how would Jesus be. It it goes right to who he is. And so we would plug his presence into our marriage and we would ask the question, you know, if Jesus were married to my spouse, How would that be? If Jesus lived on my neighborhood, in my street, how would that be? If Jesus had my employees or my employers, how would I be? If Jesus was on my team, if Jesus was in my class, how would he manifest himself through my life? That's what I mean by learning Jesus. And what I'd like to do is something a little different today is get right to the application, and then we'll do some teaching time afterwards, okay? Because you're probably curious, okay, how do I go about that? How do I go about learning Jesus, all right? Here's some suggestions that Frost gives us. First of all, pour over the Gospels. Pour over the Gospels. Devote yourself to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say about the life and times of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the actions of Christ, the demeanor of Christ, every aspect of Christ. Pour yourself into that. Now, I know that for a lot of us, you already have a Bible reading program, as I do, and so you're reading through Scripture maybe in a year or four years or three years, and you want to keep doing that? By all means, keep doing that. Keep going along and doing that, but insert in the course of the week some time, some specific time, just to learn Jesus. And so you'd be reading Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and all of it, and it's not like you want to learn what Matthew says, what Mark says, and Luke and John, what they say, but rather you want to learn about the the appearance of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, the response of Jesus. How did he respond in situations? And so that's what I mean by devouring the gospels, just getting in and taking a specific amount of time. Or it could be this, once a month, during your devotional time, however long that is, you devote a time to read through an entire gospel all in one sitting. And you're kind of going, it doesn't take that long. I know that the Gospels seem long. Matthew has 28 chapters. Luke has 24. John has 21. Mark has 16. But here's the thing. It doesn't take you as long as you think. And to just sit down and read through 
a gospel in one sitting, learning Jesus, seeing how he responded in different situations, I think would be so powerful for us. But then a second suggestion, read about Jesus. There are all kinds of really great books out there about Jesus and who he is, really good ones and there's some really bad ones. And it may be that you end up reading some really bad ones. I think it's very healthy to learn what Jesus is not, even though you're learning what Jesus is. Let me give you some suggestions on books that I've read that have truly impacted my life. This first one is by N.T. Wright, entitled Simply Jesus. And it's a great little book, it's not very long. And he just, he just doesn't, he does, I don't think like he thinks. And I like reading authors that don't think like I think. And N.T. Wright is that way, and he does a really great work talking about the life and times of Jesus and gives us some insight onto that. I highly recommend that. Another book here is, and this one I read probably 30 years ago, and it still impacts me to this day. If you're a church kid, if you grew up knowing about Jesus through Sunday school and VBS and kids camp, kids camp at home, just if you haven't signed up yet, go ahead and do that. I'll wait. This is a great book for church kids. Phil Yancey, The Jesus I Never Knew. Uh, He writes very, very well. It's a very easy read, and it's very devotional, very reflective, and I think that you would enjoy that. Another book that I think is very good, really anything by Tim Keller, but this one, The King's Cross, is an excellent book for us to read through if you want to learn some more about Jesus. But then for those of you that might want to go a little deeper, you're a little bit more academic in thinking, you want to be challenged that way, I would highly recommend this one, The Cross of Christ by John R. W. Stott. He passed away several years ago, but this book will be very, very pivotal in the life of Christians for many centuries to come, I believe, simply because it was such a watershed work at the time and it remains to be that way. So there are different ways that you can be able to learn about Jesus and read about Jesus so that you can be able to understand some things from Scripture. But then there's a third suggestion that I want to give you, and it's this one, widen your viewing about Jesus. You know as well as I that there are all kinds of movies out there about Jesus. I would suggest that you watch them all. I can remember Debbie and I, when we were in youth ministry, back when Dirt was young, we, we watched a movie about the life of Jesus and he actually had, was blonde hair, blonde beard, blue eyes, looked like a surfer from California, but that's supposed to be our Messiah. And it was just, we, we kind of laughed. And so some of them, some of them, are, they're really trying really hard to be biblically centered, all that kind of stuff, but they're kind of humorous. But then some of them, even though they claim to be biblically centered or not, like Godspell or The Last Temptation of Christ. I think it'd be healthy to watch those only so that you know that they're not consistent with Scripture. You can be able to look at those with your Bible wide open. Certainly, you can watch The Passion of Christ, but mom and dad, you need to be wise about whether you want your children to watch that or not. But Debbie and I watched a series right before COVID happened, right before the quarantine, and it's entitled The Chosen. And I... By far, this is the best series. It's an eight-episode series. I think that they, they want to make more. But by far, this is the best series that we have ever seen on the life of Christ. The first eight episodes are just about the choosing of the 12 disciples. And it is, the casting is wonderful. Um, the, 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 uh, the story is really great. And yes, the writers, they do fill in some blanks when it comes to things that we may not be clear about, but I think they've done as well a job, as good a job as anyone has ever done on that. And so I highly recommend that you look at The Chosen. And I think it's something you have to buy. I think it's worth it if you buy it. It'd be good. All right, so what I'd like to do now is turn a corner and, and what happens when we learn Jesus. What happens when we learn Jesus? And number one, we will begin to see Jesus differently. You see, if, if, we, don't, if we are not informed by the Jesus of the Bible, then we will form a view of Jesus that is not from the Bible. It's, it's a classic problem that we all have. For those of us that may not know that much about Jesus, we, we tend to make up one of our own. Case in point, you might remember the movie Talladega Nights. I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen this one clip I'm gonna read to you. 
And it's, it's a Will Ferrell movie about, and Will Ferrell plays a fictional character called Ricky Bobby, who's a NASCAR ch- driving champion. And a typical Will Ferrell movie, it's over the top, it's exaggerated, and all the stereotypes of NASCAR drivers are found in this one character, Ricky Bobby. And probably the most well-known uh, uh, episode in the movie was sitting down at the dinner table. They've got Taco Bell, they've got Burger King, they've got KFC, and Ricky Bobby is going to say grace. And so he says grace, and he prays to dear baby Jesus. And as he's praying for, to dear baby Jesus, his wife Carly interrupts and says this, you know, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. And Ricky responds, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus, teenage Jesus, bearded Jesus, or whoever you want. And so Ricky continues to pray. <clears throat> Dear tiny baby Jesus, with your gold fleece diapers, with your tiny little fat balled up fist, and then Chip, who is Ricky's father-in-law, he chimes in and yells, he was a man, he had a beard. And Ricky responds, look, I like the baby Jesus version the best. And then Cal, who is Ricky's best friend, he he chimes in and says, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party too. I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. And then one of Ricky's sons chimes in. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Then Cal once again interjects. I like to picture Jesus with like giant eagle's wings and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with like an angel band and I'm in the front row. And this goes on. And I'm reading this not for comic relief. I'm reading this as kind of an exaggerated metaphor is this, if you don't know the Jesus of the Bible, if you don't know the Jesus in the Bible, then you will make up a Jesus in your mind that will not resemble the Jesus of the Bible. And so as you devour the gospel, as you begin to look at the gospel, you will find out that no one, no one would have ever invented this person. I think it was Anne Lamont who paraphrased years ago. She just simply said, you know that you have remade Jesus in your image when he hates the same people you hate. And brothers and sisters in Christ, There comes a point when we stop learning about Jesus and we learn Jesus, we learn who he is. And right now, I wanna just talk to those of us, and myself included, who grew up in a church. I think that there are tremendous advantages for a child growing up within a church. Tremendous advantages. But there could be some disadvantages as well. One of the disadvantages is that we have inadvertently told children and discipled our children that there is a humongous difference between worshiping Jesus and following Jesus. That these two things are separate. And we have discipled our young people that I can have this casual relationship with Jesus and know about him and come on Sunday and sing songs from the heart, raising my hand, clapping, standing, worshiping him, loving him, and then following him. Well, that's kind of up to me. And we have relegated Jesus to Sunday status. Can I just say it this way? And young people, I'd like you just to listen for a moment. You cannot Facebook stalk Jesus. You can't Facebook stalk Jesus. He will not allow that. You must follow him. And that's difficult. Facebook, I know it's a big thing, and and all the younger people are off Facebook now, and us older folks have taken it over like everything else, right? But I went on my own page. I, I never go on my own page just to look at the about part. If someone were to stalk me, and I don't have a bunch of people stalking me, but I, look, and I haven't touched that home page in, in years. And I looked, it says, you can learn my name, you can learn what I do for a living, you can learn where I grew up, you can learn the schools that I went to, you can even learn my wife's name. By and large, that's pretty much it. You can learn about me and then request friendship, but we all know Facebook friendship is a little different. But I think that what has happened is that we have said, I want to know about Jesus, I want to know the big stuff that gets me in. Virgin birth, check. Live life on this world, taught some parables, did some miracles, check. Died on the cross for my sins, check. Rose from the grave, check. Ascended to the Father, check. Coming to, back to get me, check. 
and then we go and live our lives. We're robbing ourselves of blessings, but also we're robbing others of that blessing as well. You can't Facebook stalk Jesus. He will not allow that. He says, you need to follow me. Yeah, it's really great that you're singing songs to me, but those songs are canceled out simply because you refuse to follow me. A disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who follows. I mean, look, for example, look at Philippians. The apostle, we've got a great example of this with the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter three, he kind of gives his resume of what life was like before he met Christ. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Oh, I need you to go back. Sorry, you need to go back. If it's there, maybe it's not there. Previous verses, verses three through uh, six of Philippians chapter three. Can't find it? Yes or no? Okay. okay, Is it there? It's on that. Well, here's the thing. What Paul is talking about in verses four through six, he is simply saying, "I, I, I was... I was the poster child for what a Jew should be. I I knew where I was from. My roots were the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I knew the law inside and out, and I followed the law. I persecuted Christians. And all that he's saying there, everything that he's saying there is simply this. I hated Jesus, and I hated Christians. I hated everything about them. But then something changed between verse six in Philippians chapter three, and you'll have to read it on your own, and verse seven. Go back to verse seven if you can. If, if it's not, let me know. Okay, it must be out. Okay, so in verse seven, it is simply this. I have counted everything. Whatever I gained, I had, I count as loss. Why? Because of Christ. I count everything as loss purely because of Jesus. And how wonderful and how powerful that is for us to be able to know that and to embrace that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is so vitally important that as we learn Jesus, we will begin to see him differently. We will see him differently. But you know, number two, we will see the church differently. We, we all have our gripes about the church. We all have our gripes about Christians. I have mine, you have yours. And we could probably commiserate over a cup of coffee someday to talk about all the things that are wrong. But when we learn Jesus, when we learn him and truly learn him, all of a sudden we find these aspects that we have this strange, never before love for the body of Christ. And how wonderful that is. You see, Jesus had this vertical relationship with his father that played out, that bled out into the horizontal relationship with others. That's why in the New Testament, there are so many verses, so many passages on the one another's. Let me just read some to you, okay? These are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read five, all right, five. Mark 9, 50, be at peace with one another. John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 15, 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Why? Why do we do all of these one another's? Why is that? Christ. Jesus is the one that taught us these things. Oh, there they are, good. But Jesus is the one who taught us these things. That we are to love one another. And you know what? I read to you five verses, five passages on one another. Do you know how many there are in the New Testament? Forty. Forty. That when we learn Jesus, we begin to see Jesus differently. And guess what? Because of that, we begin to see people differently, primarily the church. And all of a sudden, we look around and we see, yeah, 
We see, we see fellow sinners, and the emphasis is on the word fellow. Fellow sinners. Just as messed up as anybody else, and yet we are lifting up our holy hands and our, our hearts to this Christ, and we worship him. And how great is that? You see, that's what happens when we learn Jesus. We begin to see the church, we see Christians differently. We begin to see them the way that Jesus saw them. So we see Jesus differently. We see the church differently. But then also, we see the world differently. We see this world in a completely different light. That's what I want to challenge you as you learn Jesus, as you're reading about him in the Gospels. See and learn to see what he saw. Just pick that out. What I want to do right now is, I, if your Bibles are open, I'd like you to close them or turn them off, one of the two. And I'm going to read you a Bible story. It's Bible story time. And I want to read you a Bible story. It's a story that you probably have heard before. It's a great story. It's about Jesus. It's in Mark chapter 5. And you can read it later on if you want, the first 20 verses. But I'm just going to sit down here, and I'd like to just read it to you, okay? Read the story to you, and I'm going to ask you this question. Who do you identify with most in the story, all right? And we'll talk about it later on, but who do you identify with most in the story? Here's uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, all right? If you want to close your eyes, take away the distractions, go ahead and do that. But just listen to this really great story. Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he rent the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen Describe to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region as he was getting into the boat. The man who had been possessed with demons begged Jesus that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away. And began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Pretty cool story. Not hard to picture. Now let me ask you in, who do you identify with? Do you identify with the demon-possessed guy? You know what it is that others want to control you. You know what it is to be out of control. You know what it is to feel like you're being ruled by something else or someone else. 
And you so desperately want freedom from that. And that might be you. It might be that you are controlled and overwhelmed by an addiction of some type and you have tried all kinds of techniques. You have tried all kinds of things and you are desperate. You are in despair. You are hopeless. So maybe you identify with the demon-possessed guy. Or maybe you identify with the villagers, not the village people, but the villagers. You identify with them that, that all of a sudden this person with great power, has overpowered someone that you as a villager tried to control. You were one of the ones that put chains on this guy to try and bind him and control him, and you couldn't, so you relegated him to his tombs. You, you kicked him out of the village, and you told your kids, don't you play down there. And you'd hear at night the cries of this guy screaming out in agony, and you'd just cover your ears, and all oh, that's the lunatic down by the tombs. And all of a sudden, this one guy just shows up and now this man who you saw is breaking chains and salivating and cutting himself is now all of a sudden in his right mind learning at Jesus' feet. And you're kind of going, what is going on? And it may be that your first response to Jesus working in your heart right now is fear. I don't, I don't like what I'm feeling right now. I don't like what I'm experiencing right now. Maybe you identify with the villagers. Maybe you identify with the villagers in the way of controlling the demon-possessed guy. You just want all the people that are not like you to just go away. Maybe you identify with the villagers. Or how about this? The herdsmen. Kind of feel bad for them. 2,000 pigs? That's a lot of pig. And all of a sudden, they're floating belly up in the Sea of Galilee. And what's going on? They, they run in fear. Of course they'd run in fear. Have you ever heard pigs squeal? Now multiply that by 2,000. I think I'd be running too. So maybe you identify with the herdsmen. They've lost their herds simply because this guy commanded legions of demons to go into some pigs, and now they're all gone. Maybe you identify with the herdsmen. How about the disciples? They're with Jesus and Jesus wants to go to the cliff where the tombs are. That's typically not where you dock a boat. That's set aside away from the village. Jesus, are we going to go to the village? No, let's, let's beach the boat right here. But Jesus, the people are over there. I know, but there's a person over here. And they're bewildered. They don't, they don't know what's going on. They don't, okay, we're, he's our master. He's our rabbi. We do what he says. Okay, let's beach the boat right here. And then all of a sudden, a guy who's probably known throughout the region as the demoniac of the Gerasenes is running after them, and they're thinking, oh man, here it goes. I've heard about this guy. He's nuts. So maybe you're like the disciples, or you identify with Jesus. You know, I've, I've done this exercise with young people before. Never with this story, but with other stories that are very similar to this one. And I'll ask for a raise of hands. How many of you identify with this person, this person, this person, this person? The fewest number of hands. I always ask the question last. How many of you identify with Jesus? The fewest amount of hands. Raise their hands with Jesus. And yet, that's the point of the story. Is that we learn Jesus. And what we learn of Jesus is how he sees people that we are afraid of how he deals with the fear that we have, how he deals with people who are out of control, how he deals with people in desperation. We learn that about him. And so all of a sudden, we see now, we no longer see rage and anger, we see desperation in people's lives. We see fear. People are afraid they're afraid for all kinds of reasons, even without COVID, but you put COVID in, and it's just fear on steroids. But when we learn Jesus, then all of a sudden, we are not afraid because we see people the way that he sees them. He sees them in desperation, in desperate need of purpose, in desperate need of love, in desperate need of mercy and forgiveness. And they are not in need of your rant on Facebook. They are not in need of your political views. They are in need of your Jesus. 
And that may be you right now. You may have come online, you might be in a watch party in the neighborhood and some friends invited you. First of all, thank you so much on behalf of your friends to trust them to come over, but maybe, just maybe, it's you. Maybe right now, Jesus, not me, but Jesus is speaking to you, to your very soul, saying, listen, you need me. You need what I have to offer you. And if that's you, then we want to talk to you to add us to your friendship list. And so if you want to do that, then you can absolutely text Arcade, um, what is it? Arcade Follow. Arcade Follow 484848. Arcade Follow 484848. And we would love to talk with you. Someone will call you or email you. And we'd love to talk to you about this incredible Jesus But right now, Arcadians, how about it? Are you you prepared to not just learn about Jesus, but to learn Jesus? And take that specific amount of time each week and learn him. I pray that that happen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all your love and your care. Father, I pray for those right now in their homes or their living room or back porch that they're online with us and they're watching and and something's going on in their soul that might be fearful to them because it's never happened before. By the power of your spirit, will you just simply speak to them and reassure them and give them rest. Allow them, Father, to actually think about believing in you because of who Jesus is and what he has done. We ask these things, Lord, because you are so good to us and so wonderful and your spirit has given us this power that needs to be displayed. And so as we learn your son, as we learn Jesus, may those around us see more and more of him and less and less of ourselves. In your son's holy and precious name. Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.